speaker today. I hope I get the name right because last week I apparently muffed it somehow. Uh, I don't know. The Klein McCabe, professor of biology at St. Michael's. His research explores biological diversity in Lake Champlain and its tributaries. He has a forthcoming book, um, collecting more than 40 of his published essays on ecology and the natural history of freshwater organisms. Would you please welcome Professor Ekman Mate. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm curious, can people hear me okay with the mask on? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well. Take it off. Take it off. Take it off. Take it off. I, uh, I'm fully vaccinated. I'm over 50, so I got four boosts. I got the fourth booster in, so I, you know, and I, and I took a COVID test in the car this morning before I got here. So that's the best I can do. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me, and we'll, we'll whip through this fairly quickly. Um, I have sort of a, divided up into sections. So I have life in the top of the water, life in flowing water, standing water, connections to the land, and problems and solutions. And uh, I work with a whole army of people doing various things. A whole bunch of colleagues at St. Mike's. And my family are very patient with my strange obsession with insects in the water. And uh, a whole lot of students support the work as well. They come and they do student research. And that's how I get a lot of things done. And um, you can get a lot of things done if you've got a whole army of, of 20 year olds to help you. So, so I do. And I work a lot with Northern Woodlands Magazine. And uh, they help me write. I can write, I can put the content down, but those folks are really good editors, and they turn my writing into English. <laughs> so, very grateful for them. And then last, Adelaide Murphy Tyrell is the artist who uh, does this kind of thing. And she's shared wonderful art with me, and when I tried to put the book together, she, I said, how much do I owe you for the art? She's like, I already got paid for the art, just put it in the book, put my name on there. So, it's amazing. <laughs> so, there we go. Um, I was, grew up in Ireland, I usually have to tell people because the accent is faded. I came over for the summer, forgot to go home. I went from to St. Joseph's University, then Pittsburgh, and finished up in UVM because my wife got a job at UVM and I went along with her. So here we are, and I've been at St. Mike's since 2001, so there's the, there's the history. So I want to talk about water, first of all, and how water is different than other things. So if you were to put some candle wax, Molten candle wax in the glass and let it solidify. If anyone's, who's made candles? Anyone made candles? Right? So it's going to solidify from the bottom up, right? And that's how most things work. They cool down, they shrink, and they start to solidify. But water does something different. So this is, you can do it as many times as you want. The candle wax is always going to solidify from the bottom. Now I'd like you to imagine what would happen if Lake Champlain did that. What would it like be like in the middle of summer in Lake Champlain? if it had solidified from the bottom. It's still of ice down there, right? But that's not what water does. Water does the opposite. Water chills down to four degrees Celsius, and that's its maximum density, and then it starts to expand. But all those molecules that were bouncing against each other and you know, basically playing three-dimensional tag, when they start to, to form up into hexagons, and those hexagons start to stack, you get an expansion of the molecule. And so, ice floats is the bottom line. So, and this is a fun thing to do with, with, with children. Get a five gallon bucket filled with water, stick it out there. When you get to about this stage, take it in, drill a hole in there, drain out the water, stick a candle in there. It's kind of a cool looking thing. Did it with my kids. You gotta get the really cold weather for that. Anyway, bottom line is we have liquid water under ice. That's really important. Our lakes and our seas, they don't freeze solid, which is also really important. And there is a pretty constant temperature underneath the ice. And if you think about the environment, where else do you have constant temperature? You know, you go out in the, in, in the weather in Vermont, even today, there's going to be a range of temperatures. But the water under that ice is constant the whole summer, the whole winter long. It just, it's four degrees Celsius. And there it is, right? So, that allows us to have life. And <clears throat> life wouldn't have evolved in the same way that we know it. <clears throat> if our lakes were frozen to the bottom. Just try to imagine it. 
I can't even conceptualize it. Right? And of course you can have ice fishing, right? Which is a nice Vermont feature. And the ice fishing people have known for generations, but there's plenty of life under the ice, right? So, there we go. Another cool thing about water is heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to heat up water. And because of that, the water is storing that heat. You put the energy into the water to warm it up, that energy is in there and it's stored. And you can get it back again. And that's why the radiators in your house work, right? And that's why your engine doesn't overheat. So if you look at some numbers, here's air temperature in this particular location. And this is um, Otter Brook. I'm not sure where Otter Brook is exactly. It's still this online somewhere. But if you look at Otter Brook, you can see it fluctuates, but not nearly as much as the air temperature. And if you go to a bigger river, it's fluctuating, but still not as much as the air temperature. And then if you go to groundwater, groundwater, right? Very, very little fluctuation. Because the earth, the rocks, the soil, it's a huge heat sink. And when you get, if you go to Smuggler's Notch and head across into Stowe, on the left-hand side where the trucks get stuck, there's something, <laughs> yeah, seriously, there's something called uh, Big Spring. Very imaginative name right there. Big Spring is the same temperature year-round. Doesn't matter when you go there, it'll be flowing, and it's the, it's the same as the average air temperature. And if you go down, I think it's like five degrees Celsius. If you go down to Pennsylvania, there's one down there, and it's nine degrees Celsius year-round. So it reflects the average air temperature. So, water is very, very stable. So, <clears throat> the storing and releasing is important because of things like this, for example. This is the Gulf Stream. We've got the water heated up around Florida and the, and the Gulf of Mexico. Comes up this way, up, up along the coast. It means that the, the climate in Boston and Maine and places like that is much more moderate than you would expect it to be for that latitude. And if you go to the other extreme, to where I come from, you know, Ireland is not a frozen waste. So I grew up in the same latitude as Edmonton, right? And one of my jobs was working in a, in a sewage plant. Important work, to say. I was working in a sewage plant. We measured the temperature every day. And I put it in there because I forget. The coldest we ever got was 21 degrees Fahrenheit in, in the midlands of Ireland. Edmonton, in January, gets to a high of 19. So it's because of the moderation all of the heat that's released by that water. And we get a certain amount of that effect in the Champlain Valley as well. I used to live in Westford, which is a good distance from the lake. And I'd come down to Burlington and I'd see people's daffodils up. And I'd go back to Westford and I'd be like, why are, why are my daffodils, you know? So we are moderated by the lake. It, it stabilizes our temperatures. So that's important. And it's also important for animals. And surface tension. Surface tension is another cool thing. Um, other liquids don't have the same surface tension that water has. And so you can put a paper tip. What you do is you take a piece of tissue paper, you stick a sewing needle or a razor blade or a paper tip on the tissue paper, and the tissue paper will saturate and sink, and you'll get it balanced straight on the surface tension. And it's steel, right? It's not floating. If it, if it's denser than water, it should sink, right? Yeah. But the surface tension holds up. And that can be a force for good for some organisms. And if you're the wrong organism, it can be a force for bad. So that surface tension is a spider web for some organisms, right? Um, you know, but the things that can ride that surface tension can take advantage of it. And I've got a few of those I'm going to talk about. So let's start off with this one here. Anybody got spider phobias? <laughs> We're all good? Okay. This is the biggest spider in Vermont. It's the uh, six spotted, um, don't count the spots because you're counting the wrong spots. It's a six spotted water spider. And that's on a child's hand over there, so bad it is hard. Um, they sit out in the vegetation, and they put two or three legs out onto the surface tension, and they just hang out there. And when they feel a the vibration, they run out across the water surface, and they grab whatever fell in, and they run back again. And they are called fishing spiders, and they can eat fish. They sometimes will get a small fish that's injured and struggling and stuck in the surface tension. But mostly they're getting uh, insects and things that have fallen in. And someone did a study on their diet, and mostly they were eating water striders, which is something else we're going to talk about. But if an ant falls in, that's fodder for the, uh, for the fishing spider. And this is why they're called six spot. Obviously, they were named by somebody who had a microscope and turned one upside down and counted the spots. But that's where the six spots are. But whoever gets to see the underside, uh, unless you're getting, getting eaten by it, I suppose, right? <laughs> so. Um, 
The other issue with these is the males, when they approach the females, they've got small males compared to the female, that the male has to do a special dance and vibrate the water in a specific way. Otherwise, instead of having a date, he's going to become snack food. So, so yeah. And if the female isn't in the mood, it doesn't matter what dance he does, he's snack food anyway. So, uh, and then when they do actually reproduce, it's, it's a one time only for the male. And he, he's snack food at the end anyway. So it's a, it's a multi-purpose uh, function there for the male. So there you go. This is one that was on one of my trail cameras. So I don't know if you use trail cameras, but they're a good size spider. And when you open up the case of your tail, trail camera, that thing is looking out there. I don't care how fond you are of bugs, that's going to get your attention. They're, they're a big spider. <laughs> so I, I do like them, but um, I also uh, they also give me a little bit of pause when I open up and see one. <laughs> this is sort of the most common thing that people see on the surface. So water striders have these great big legs. If you imagine it on a human scale, they've got one pair of legs that's about seven feet long and another pair of legs that's about nine feet long for, for a six foot tall person, if you, if you do the math. And then they do have a third pair of legs because they are insects. So the third pair of legs are at the front and they work just like the spider's legs in that they're feeling vibrations. <coughs> and when they feel the vibrations, they'll orient and they'll whip on out there. And Unlike a spider, they don't have the fangs that a spider has. Instead, they've got a spike that, you know, if it was on a human scale again, it would be like a nail coming out of the palm of your hand. And that's how they catch things. And then when they do catch them, they have a piercing mouth part. They stick it in like a drinking straw, they inject enzymes and, and toxins, and then they, they suck out the contents and leave the husk behind. Um, if you're working with kids in a nature center or something, you can not actually take ants and drop them on the water surface and they'll, they'll go for them. You'll, you'll see it happen. They, they're very efficient. So water striders, this is how they stay up. They have these um, water repellent hairs. <clears throat> and they repel so much water that they can hold up about 20 times their own weight with, with that you know, water repellent hair. And I've never seen this, but they can actually jump off the water surface. If, if uh, things are not ideal, if there's too many water striders, if there's too many predators, if there's not enough food, they can take those four legs that are on the water, they whip them tight, and they actually get airborne, and they fly, and they go off and find somewhere else. They, they spend the winter in the vegetation, in the leaves, near the ponds, and when, the, when things thaw out, they hop back in and off they go again. So, kind of kind of fun little things. Uh, have you seen these ones? These, these are called whirligig beetles. So if you're in a pond or on a reservoir somewhere, you're out paddling, and you see these little chrome dome beetles whipping around in a circle, you usually see lots of them, and these are called whirligig beetles. The cool thing is that these have, they can dive, they can go under the water, the water striders can't, the water striders are strictly on top, but these folks, if, if these folks, these beetles, if they get spooked, will die. And once they're under the water, and they're very powerful swimmers. When they're on the water, there's a couple of important features. First of all, they have counter shading like a lot of fish have and a lot of birds have. So the bottom side is the pale. So if they're viewed from below, they're pale against the pale sky. If they're viewed from above, they're dark against the dark pond floor, right? And so it's, it, military aircraft do the same thing. They'll do, use counter shading to reduce the chances of them being seen. The other cool thing though, which is really unique, there's a pair of eyes up and down. There's a pair of eyes looking up. So they've got four eyes. The eyes internally join. So morphologically, they really have just two eyes. But in terms of their function, they function like four eyes. A pair of eyes looking down, see what's coming from below. A pair of eyes looking up, see what's coming from above. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. They're, they're, they're amazing little beetles. Um, <laughs> one of my students photographed this. You might see a little divot right here. It was photographed as a, a beetle that's been dead 20 years and was on, mounted on a pin like insects are. But first time I showed the side, people were like, can you take away that nail that goes right through the middle of the body? So we, we photoshopped out the pin to make it more acceptable to, to younger audiences. <laughs> Other thing with surface tension that is really important and has an application to every one of us. This is a raft of mosquito eggs. And many mosquito species will lay their eggs in rafts on the surface, and they float. 
This is mosquito larva. Here are a bunch of them. And they come up and they have a snorkel. And they breathe out of the rear end. That's how they get their oxygen. And that's why a mosquito can live in very stagnant water. They're not dependent on clean water because they're getting their oxygen from, from, from the air. They're not using gills, mostly, to get their oxygen, right? So they come up, they need the surface tension to breathe. So now you've got two parts of the life cycle that need surface tension to, to survive. And I'll tell you why this is important in a second. Here's the next part of the life cycle. These are the, the pupae. So when you think of pupa, I think of Eric Carl's The Very Hungry Caterpillar that becomes a chrysalis, right? And it sits there and does nothing. And then it, it, a lot's happening, but it doesn't move. It doesn't feed. It doesn't. These, these things swim around. They're, 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 they're pupae, but they're still moving. And they eventually come to the surface. They've got, they, they've got to get to the surface to breathe also. And they do come. Here's an old diagram I pulled out of an old textbook. They split along the back and the adult climbs out. And as soon as the adult climbs out, it's ready to go. It, it's water repellent. It can stand on the water surface. It can fly off immediately. So again, it needs the water surface to get to that point. There's the pupa. That's the skin that we find. And there's the adult taking off, looking for you and looking for me. <laughs> so let's say you've got a water font uh, for your birds. You want, to feed, you want your birds to have some water. And maybe you've got a backyard pond. All you need is something that creates a little bit of wave and you won't have mosquitoes. You just have to break up the surface tension. Um, in the old school books, they'd say, why don't you put some detergent in there? But that's not good for anybody. It's bad for the mosquitoes, but it's not good for anything else either. So I wouldn't encourage that. But if you can have a bubbler, they make these little solar powered fountains. But they're a few dollars on, on you know, Amazon or wherever. Plop it on in there. That'll break up the surface tension enough so you won't have a mosquito problem and your neighbors won't complain about your pond. You know, sometimes you gotta keep the neighbors happy too, right? The other thing about mosquitoes, a bigger issue, a more common issue, is your rain gutters. So, <laughs> a rain gutter is a pond, and it's a pond that's very, very close to mosquito food sources, which would be you and I, right? So it's important to clean out your gutters. Um, if you're interested to see who's living in there, you want to get a pair of um, nylon stockings, you know, the, the complete pair of them, and then get yourself some cable ties, and put it on the downspout, and tie it on there nice and tight, and then unclog your, your gutters, and you'll get all of the stuff that's living in your gutters. You can turn it upside down into a basin and see who is living there, and you'll find that you had a lot of mosquitoes. You'll also find midges. Sometimes if your gutters have been clogged for a long time, you'll find even dragonflies living in them. So it's, it's a linear pond. So clean your gutters and you'll reduce your mosquito issues. All right, what else have we got? I see them images from everywhere. Sometimes I remember to cite them, but this is what I saw online. This is not my house. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna move on to flowing water for a little bit. So different things live in different habitats. So we talked about where the mosquitoes are gonna live. Flowing water is constantly moving because it's constantly moving, it's highly oxygenated. So that's an advantage for a lot of things. It's also flushing and eroding away um, deposits. So you've got less sedimentation. That sediment is kept up in the water column because of the movement. And that's a food source, right? Um, so that's food delivery, like a conveyor belt coming constantly for some organisms. And we'll talk about or if any, any, oh, by the way, any questions as we go, uh, stick your hand up, give me a yell, you know, throw something at me. I'm happy to stop and talk and explore any of these things that are interesting to you. Just, you know, stop me if you need to. All right, anyway, food delivery is happening, but there's also a downstream risk. And that is when things get washed out of a river habitat, they don't know where they're going. They could be going to another piece of river that's great habitat, but they could be going to a pond where they're going to suffocate and die. So the things that are adapted to living in water need ways to stay in that flowing water and not get washed out stream. And that's true for you know small mountain streams like that, or it's true for bigger rivers like that. This is Bellows Fall. I saw one of those historical UVM photographs that they have in the archives. Kind of fun. Anyway, the food that comes in for most rivers and, and ponds and lakes comes in in the fall. So all of these beautiful things that 
tourists come to see by the busload, all of those leaf papers come from leaf season. That's just the beginning of leaf season for aquatic habitats. So the food comes in in the fall, the fresh leaves come in and they are inedible. If you think about a leaf from a tree's point of view, it's a factory for sucking carbon out of the air, turning it into sugars and starches and cellulose, right? And, and that's, that's what it needs to do. And it isn't there to feed a bunch of insects and caterpillars and everything else. And so to defend itself, the tree produces poisons, toxins, tannins, indigestible things to slow down the insects trying to eat it. And even though the chlorophyll is sucked back into the tree before the leaf falls down, all of those other things are left behind and some of them are really toxic. So the food is no good at that point when it falls into the river. We need a process called conditioning. And so a little bit of it is like a tea bag. You're soaking the leaf and soaking it and the water's flowing over it. And it's washing away and diluting away the poisons and the various things that make it toxic. And then the bacteria and the fungi grow on top of it. And once the fungi and the bacteria are in there, that leaf is considered conditioned and it's ready to be eaten. And they have things called shredders, a whole bunch of different insects that eat the leaves. Cool thing about leaves, not all leaves are created equal. So when you think about raking your leaves in the fall, right, once you've got the maples all raked up, the oak trees are watching you, right? And they wait until you're done. And then they drop all the oak leaves. And then they wait until the snow comes and they drop a few more, right? So there's this constant delivery of food through the system. From an insect's point of view, something like a linden leaf is super, super soft. Linden is available to eat really fast. Oak leaves are like leather. So not only have you got timed delivery, you've got different types of leaves that are ready at different times of the year. So the fall produces a food base for an entire season. Right into the middle of summer, there's still fall leaves that are in different states of edibility for the entire the base of the food web. So, really important stuff. And then you've got these shredders that are coming to eat it. So this one is a giant stonefly. Stoneflies are in the order of Plecoptera. I'm gonna go through a few insect groups, not a whole, not a whole lot of them. I could, I could do a whole thing, a whole semester on the bugs. I'm not gonna do that to you, I promise. Um, stoneflies have two tails, back end, um, they don't technically call them tails, they call them CD, but whatever. Um, they're there, and there's two of them. Um, all of the stoneflies have just two. Mayflies, most of the mayflies are going to have three. So when you see mayflies, they're a much less robust looking bug, and they've got three tails. So you, th those are two of the major groups that, that, that you'll find in streams and ponds. And if you get up close and personal and you've got a microscope, you're going to see that they've also got two claws at the front end, at, at each leg. So the claws are another way to identify them. The mayfly, mayflies have a single claw. So these are the things you would learn if you got super into bugs. Any fly fishing people? Sometimes I have fly fishing people, and they always know more about the bugs than I do. Um, and they, they'll ask me, what's hatching in such and such a place? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Get out there with a net and you tell me what's hatching. <laughs> so, if you are gonna fly fish, you better match the hatch. Um, another big leaf shredder, this one is, uh, a, it's, it's, the, it's, it, it's Tuculidae is the family, and they're the paint flies. So, if you've ever turned your lights on and light left the window open, you might see what looks like a, a huge mosquito flying in, and that's a crane fly. Some people call them um, daddy long legs flies, which causes all kinds of confusion, because daddy long legs are not even an insect. And then some people call them mosquito hawks, and they'll tell you that they eat mosquitoes. And then some people think they're big mosquitoes. So there's lots of confusion caused by, by these flies. But all of the true flies, including the uh, crane flies, uh, the larvae are maggots and they don't have any legs. So if you see something that is completely lacking legs, it's, it's, it's a maggot and therefore a true fly. And it will become an adult that has two wings. Which sounds, people think of two wings, yeah, of course, it's, it's a bug that flies around, of course it's got two wings. But that's not what's typical for bugs. If you look at most bugs, they're going to have four wings. So butterflies and moths have a pair at the front, a pair at the back, dragonflies have four wings. Most insects have four wings. The true flies, uh, and that will be most of the things that want to bite you, are going to be true flies. If they're not ticks, they're going to be true flies. So think about it, mosquitoes, horse flies, deer flies, all of them are true flies. 
Um, there are some exceptions, like if you're in the tropics, the kissing bugs would want to bite you and <coughs> spread nasty diseases, and they're, they're, they're not a valid problem. Anyway, where was I going? <laughs> Instead of the, uh, the traditional four wings, the, the uh, true flies have an extra piece that replaces the, the second pair of wings. And they spin these things around and use them for balance when they're flying. And we know this because somebody ran the obvious experiment and they took a fly and they cut them off and turned it loose and the thing flew like this. So we know that these are, are used in balance. But if you ever have any doubt about identifying a true fly, you see that little thing, you know for certain. That's called a halteri. You know for certain it's a true fly. So. And uh, the other thing they've done is they've messed with the genetics of them with fruit flies, of course, and they were able to produce a four-ring fly by turning off the gene that makes that little balancing organ. Of course, the thing couldn't fly at that point, but they proved the point that they've got the genes for four wings, like all of the other insects. So, a anyway, little bit of entomology there. Uh, I mentioned that the rivers were <coughs> delivering food, and one of those food sources is small particles of the water. So if you look at the river after the rain, the river's going to be browner than it was before, right? And all of that, a lot of that is organic material, and it comes regularly when there's flooding, and therefore something is going to evolve to eat that stuff, right? So the other stuff we get is when those shredders are eating the leaves, they drop off little particles, and those particles, they're messy eaters, and those particles become food for something else, okay? And then finally, frass. Frass is the polite word for insect poop. And everything <laughs> poops, right? So that is a food source for something else. It might not sound appealing, but you know, if you've, if you've been around cows, you've probably seen manure flies. You know, there's something that's going to eat it. Everything is a resource. So uh, the filtering collectors are the ones that get that. And some people refer to this one as um, the, the Vermont State bird. This is a black fly, and uh, if you get really close to a black fly, it's got these little, these are the antennae, and they open and close like this, like a hand. And they are able to grab particles out of the water and use that particle as food. Does that make sense? They don't have, like, like other true flies, and, and yeah, there you go again, it's a black fly and it bites you, so it has to be a good turn right. <laughs> at this end, they've got little hooks. You put a little bit of silk on the bottom of a rock, and they hook into that piece of silk, and that's how they stay on the rock. And um, people often get this backwards. The black flies have to be in flowing water. And now you know why, because that's how they get their food. They need those particles. So black flies are always flowing water. Mosquitoes are typically standing water. So that's, you know, people will tell you, oh, you can't have a pond in your backyard, you're going to have black flies. You can tell them, no, I'm going to have mosquitoes. <laughs> so, you know, pick your poison, right? Anyway. Um, Caddisflies, this is Trichoptera. Caddisflies are the third important group. We talked a little bit about stoneflies and a little bit about mayflies. Caddisflies are another important group. People stereotypically will tell you if you've got caddisflies, you've got a clean river. <coughs> if you've got a lot of species of caddisflies, then yeah, you've got a clean river. But if all you have is this one, then you've just got a river. And there's very few rivers that I've been where I haven't got them. So just seeing caddisflies on, on its own, that's not enough to tell you you're going to clean river. You need to see many species of them. So this one uh, makes a, a big silk. It uses nozzles on the front of its head. And here is what their net looks like. They make these little nets. So each of these little things on a rock, this is in the La Platte River down in Charlotte. Each of those little things is a net. And the water is flowing through the net. And at the back of each net, there's a caddisfly living, eating the particles that got caught by the net. And if you get closer, that's what the net looks like. So that surface you're seeing there is probably like the diameter of the tip of your pinky finger. And, and those, there's, if you think about thousands upon thousands of these nets in the river, they're cleaning the water. They're reducing particles moving down the stream. So we need these things to keep the water cleaner. So, you know, it's my plug for biodiversity. Let's get as many bugs in there as we can. If you want to not get washed down the stream, we talked a little bit about that. You don't want to get washed down the stream because then your fish food, right? You want to be, one way to do it is to be very, very flat. And this is a water penny. Water pennies are super, super flat. They're shaped roughly like a penny. And underneath they've got gills. And that's how they get their oxygen. But they live so close to the rock that they don't experience 
a lot of water velocity. The water is, slows down. As you go from the fastest water is near the surface, just below the surface. As you get closer and closer and closer to the rock, the water slows down. And it slows down so much that there's what we call a boundary layer at the surface of the rock, where there's almost no flow. And so that's where they live. They're, they're so skinny, they live in that area. This is the false water bedding, does the same thing. Another way to stay aquatic is to have ballast. If you can attach a whole bunch of rocks to yourself, you're not going to flow downstream. And so these are caddisflies, again from the flat river called neophyllites. And they are quite heavy because of the rocks that they attach. They use silk. They make this little case, and the case is shaped like a sinking bag, covered in sand, and then these bigger stones attached to it. The other thing about it is they're totally camouflaged because of, of the rocks that they're using. So they've used the rocks that they found in the neighborhood. Anybody who's been in the military and learned about camouflage, you're not going to use pine branches to hide in a maple tree, right? You use what's local to your environment to camouflage. They're doing the same thing. And the last thing about it is something wanting to eat a bug doesn't necessarily want a mouthful of stones, right? So it reduces um, their chances of an eating. Some people have taken advantage of their tendency to use what they find. And so they'll take canvas flies, they'll raise them in uh, you know, semi-precious stones, and then they'll take the cases and sell them as jewelry. So uh, in your spare time, right? <laughs> I know an aquatic biologist who does this. He shows up at all the conferences, and they sell the, sell the jewelry to people. And it's, it's a novelty for someone like me. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll bring that home for the wife. She's probably never aware of it. <laughs> She's like, was well, made by a bug? <laughs> anyway, um, getting away from flowing water then, we have standing water. So lakes and ponds, and uh, it's standing water, meaning that it doesn't flow downstream, generally speaking. Okay? That's kind of roughly what we're talking about here. But it's not still water. And uh, do, does anyone like to get out in the lake? Any, any lake owners here? You, you've been out there sometimes, I'm sure, when you were wish you hadn't been out there, because the wind gets up, and it's not still water. But it's not necessarily flowing water. You've got waves coming, right? They're breaking on the beach, they're breaking on your boat, but um, it is not directional flow. Okay? So not flowing water. These habitats are more depositional, meaning that sediment gets deposited. Very different than the river. Rivers are erosional, lakes and ponds depositional. So oxygen is more limited because of the reduced amount of flow, also because of the depth. Right? Think about Lake Champlain, several hundred feet deep, three, four hundred feet deep. That's a lot of depth, a lot of way for oxygen to have to go. And then we get layering, and you don't get layering in rivers because of the mixing. So let's talk about the layering a little bit. Um, this is another of Adelaide's diagrams. So in the summertime, the water on top is warmer, and the water down below is colder. It's denser, it stays down there, right? And in between, you've got this thermocline. And if you've ever waded out into a lake or a pond, you'll sometimes reach a point where you're comfy up top, but your feet are super cold. Have you had that experience? And usually there's somebody who tells you, there's a spring out there. If you go far enough, you'll find the spring. And it's just not true. There might be a spring in some lake somewhere, but mostly it's what people tell you to explain it. And it, it's, it's, it's just not true. It's because of the layering. And you've gone deep enough in a pond in particular that's small. You've gone out and you're fighting, you know, you're up to here in the water. You're going to have cold feet. It's going to feel good sometimes in the summer. I like it. If you've gone scuba diving, your instructor, when they're teaching you, will usually take you down to the thermal sign and they'll set you at about this depth. So you're totally cold from here down and you're warm from here up. It's, it's dramatic. And then if they're training you properly, they'll take you down into the cold and they'll make you take your mask off completely, and they'll make you put it back on again. Just so you can experience that brush of cold water to your face. But it's, it's, it's stark, it's, it's, it's a stark difference. And the cool thing about it biologically is things like smelt that you could catch under the ice. They're gone down in depths of the lake where it's still cold for them. They can get winter down there in the middle of summer. It's, it's, it's dramatic. So light is different also in the depth of the lake. Lots of light on the surface. And lots of things like the algae need that life to photosynthesize, right? So you get a point high up close to the surface where there's more oxygen, be oxygen being produced than is being consumed. At some point you go deep enough, it gets so dark 
that there's more oxygen being consumed than is produced. They call that the compensation point, and below that, there is net loss of oxygen. And that's what I mean by oxygenation problems in the lakes. When you get deeper, the oxygen is getting sucked up by everything, including the algae that got ended up down there, because they're no longer in the light. And they're, they have metabolism just like you and I do, and they are sucking oxygen up because they can't produce enough, and they're producing carbon dioxide. So everything has metabolism. The other issue is at nighttime in ponds and lakes, the lights go out, and even up top, the oxygen is being consumed by the algae. Does that make sense? So we think about plants and algae producing oxygen. They do until they start consuming it, yeah. Does that have anything to do with the way so-called turning over? Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm heading. Yeah, it absolutely does. It 100% does. So, yeah, let's talk about that. So fall turnover, right? So we talked about the density of the water, right? So we've got the cold water, we've got the warm water. Fall is moving along. At some point, this water becomes colder than that water. And that's when you're going to have gravity just make it turn over. And see, so you'll get this mixing. And it's a really, really important process. And some of the other rock lakes, if they didn't have turnover, they wouldn't ever be able to get oxygen down to depth, and they would no longer be able to sustain trout. So it's really important to get that oxygen down to, to depth. And it's also important for bringing nutrients up. In a normal lake that we have polluted, this would be a good thing. We'd like to get the nutrients available. In Lake Champlain, unfortunately, we've been putting in phosphorus at an unsustainable level for too long. And so we have what's called legacy phosphorus. There was a time where if you were to farm in Vermont, they had a program where they would pay you by how much phosphorus they put on the ground. And that phosphorus is still in the ground, it's still in the soil, still washing into the lake. And so we are stuck in a situation where we get fall turnover every year, and the phosphorus gets brought up from the bottom. So we need to turn off the fossil on the phosphorus going in. But we also have to be patient and recognize it's not all going away. So, is there any questions coming? Or are we, we'll talk a, little, talk a little bit more about phosphorus in a minute. If we get to it, we'll get to it. We'll see how we do. And there's the winter time. Got your ice on top. You got four degrees Celsius down below. And uh, the wind is no longer interacting. And some interesting things happen. If it's tear ice with not much snow on top, you still get photosynthesis happening and you've got oxygen being produced. You can even have too much oxygen being produced at some times. And some of the big fish kills we've had in the Ziscoy Bay have not been because of a uh, nighttime lack of oxygen. They've been in the middle of the day when there's too much oxygen. And if you think about the chemistry, um, if you start taking oxygen and put too much oxygen into the water, too much photosynthesis happening, the algae are actually sucking out the carbon dioxide out of the water to make sugars and starches and the things that they, that they make. And the result is the water becomes alkaline because carbon dioxide dissolved in the water produces carbonic acid. And if you suck the carbon dioxide out of the water, it's no longer a buffered solution, it becomes alkaline. And then you put that in with super saturation of oxygen, it actually burns the gills of the fish. So you can get daytime fish kills in something like Francisco Bay, which is very shallow, very phosphorus enriched, and very warm because of the changing climate. So that's you know, there's, there's a lot happening, a lot of chemistry happening in the Siskoi Bay, and we're having a hard time fighting it. So, yeah, anyway, where am I going? Who knows? Life under the ice. Uh, it continues to thrive. Anybody go ice fishing? Have you ever gone ice fishing? Oh, right. Lots of life under the ice, right? So you all know that. Um, people used to think that there was a growing season in the lake, and it just stopped when the ice was there. Like, why don't I just stop it? like until 15, 20 years ago. But there's a lot of literature out there looking at the ice, uh, life under the ice, and the phytoplankton continues. And the zooplankton, little tiny little plankton organisms are eating the, the phytoplankton. This is a Daphnia, and you can see its digestive tract here. It's full of, it's packed with algae. And then bigger things are going to eat that. So there is a food web that's continuing during the, during the winter time. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is called a phantom mage. It's got a bubble at the front and a bubble at the back, and it's able to do what a scuba diver does. It's neutrally buoyant, and it can migrate up and down to the water column. And we've known for you know, decades that they did this in the middle of the summer. 
We knew that if you try to get them in the daytime, you're not going to find any near the surface. You've got to go down deep again. And if you go out at midnight and toss your plankton net out and pull it across, like magic, the phantom mages are up at the surface. And they do this because if they were up at the surface in the middle of the daytime, they'd get eaten by fish. But once the lights go out, they can sneak up, they can get all the daffodil that they want near the surface, and then back down into the sediment of nighttime. And uh, Jason Stockwell and some of the folks at UBM recently wrote a paper, and they determined that they're doing it in the wintertime as well. They went down to Shelburne Pond, they drilled some holes, they got a pump, they filled five gallon buckets full of water, and they did it on a 24 hour cycle. They ran on through a net. Sure enough, these things are migrated in the middle of winter as well. So, you know, there's new stuff being discovered all the time, which is kind of exciting. There's always more to discover. So, some of the fish do slow down in the winter, but not all of them. And you, all, you folks all know this from catching smelt or whatever else you're catching. You can get pike in the middle of winter, beautiful. I mean, you can get some beautiful fish in the winter. So, anyway, sediment is the other issue in lakes. Um, so, the sediment in the rivers mixed around, it's in the water column. And that water, as soon as it hits a lake, it slows down. And all that sediment has to go somewhere. So as the water slows down, the sediment can no longer stay up in suspension. So it settles down, right? And so if you look at, this is the Lusiskoi River coming in here. And you can see it's, it's made a, a large delta. And it's spreading out. It's distributing itself through that delta. It's made its own delta. And now it's carving a path through. <clears throat> Historically, you probably got at some point that we were, the ice had depressed the land around here. Did you guys get this at some point? No. So there was a while of ice pushed, pushed the down into the crust of the earth. And so we were well below sea level. And so where I am in St. Mike's, we're on the delta from the Minuski River. And so lots of sand got deposited and we live on that delta. It's kind of cool. And then of course the land recovered and that sand came up above the water level. Because you know, that's where we are at this point. Anyway, the layers happen every year, and they build up like annual rings on a tree. They call those layers bars. And you folks had Pat Manley in, right? Patricia Manley? So she, I, I'm gonna show you one of her slides, but she's all over this stuff. But the, the layers build up, and you get, you get pollen deposit in the summer, for example. You get faster deposition when you have melt. And then things slow down when the ice is there. So you get these annual layers. And so she's done work like, like this, and this is the, one of her famous things where the whole chunk rolled over and went upside down and possibly made a tsunami. Um, who knows? Um, yeah, I, I, I actually sent this slide to her and I said, can I use this? And she says, oh yeah, I'm going to go to talk to those folks tomorrow. So we, she and I and Tom had a good chat. <laughs> anyway, uh, they've invited me out many times to work with them. And so there's Tom heading out of his boat there. There's one of my students, a couple of his students. And it's, it, you know, they've retired now. I'm not sure what I'm going to do for getting up in the lake. But I had a good time working with those folks for years. And the, the, the device that Patricia drops down into the lake to get a sample is the same thing that I would use. So she drops it in there. Her students come along. All they need to do is fill the syringe up with sediment. That's all she needs. And so I get the layer cake that's left behind. That's mine. <laughs> and, uh, and I run this through a sieve. I'd like you to imagine trying to get that quantity of muck through a sieve, okay? So the sieve is mounted on the bottom of a five-gallon bucket. It's called a sieve bucket. And you dump that in. And the first time I told some folks, some graduate students at UVM I was going to do this, they were like, it's going to take you forever to get that through a sieve. And I was like, no, 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 no. What you do is you take the sieve, you take it over to a, a large bucket of water, and you just bounce it up and down. And it forces water up through the sieve. And that reorganizes the particles, and they go away, and they just wash out. And it takes you about two minutes. And all of that book will go through a sieve in about two minutes. You'll be filthy at the end of the day. I mean, like, no one's going to want to be near you, but you'll get your sample. So a uh, cool thing about it is, if the samples come from shallow water, you can actually see like a, a, a kind of a golden color. You see the color on the top of that? I don't know if you can see it on the screen. I think it's coming out pretty well. That's from shallow water because there's photosynthesis happening on top of the muck. And the diatoms produce that golden color. If you get into deeper water, like this one, you don't get the golden color. So there's no photosynthesis happening down there because you're down the dark part of the lake. Anyway, 
this is what I'm looking for. This is another piece of work from Adelaide. I'm trying to take a bite out of the lake and get things like burrowing mayflies that are living in the sediment and feeding. And how they feed is they wriggle their little bodies and that sucks water in one end of this tube and out the other end. And they filter particles that are coming through that pipe that they've dug. So that's how the burrowing mayflies work. Other things in the sediment, zebra mussels, everyone's favorite. They just suck water in through their bodies about um, part of a quarter water per day for zebra mussel. So people have done calculations and they can tell you how frequently the whole lake gets filtered by zebra mussels. They're, uh, they're important in the lake at this point over there. Um, uh, these are bloodworms, they're a fly larva, non-biting midges. Um, they're one of very few organisms in the lake that actually, in terms of invertebrates, they've got hemoglobin right on their skin. So even though there's not much oxygen down there, they're able to get some oxygen. The mayflies get it by sucking water through that tube constantly. And then this is one of our native mussels. This is Lampcellus, a lamp mussel. I'm going to tell you a story about a lamp mussel because I just, this, is a, this is a fun story. Um, this is what the adult mates looks like. You've probably seen these if you've gone out in the lake for any, any period of time in the summertime. So, this is a photograph taken by a birder named Rich Kelly. Anyone know Rich Kelly? I think he smoked this way somewhere, honestly. But anyway, Rich Kelly put this out on Facebook and he, he, he said, Someone bit off more than you could chew. And I was like, hang on a second. Kingfishers do not eat mussels. And I started looking it up and I went to the literature and I looked at many, many papers describing the diets of kingfishers. They don't eat mussels. And I started putting two and two together. And I wrote a piece on it and I sent it off. Adelaide did, did her, her, her magic once again. And uh, this, this is what's happening. If you look at a lamp mussel, when it's coming to its reproductive time of year, it grows this little structure off the side of its mantle. So it looks kind of like a fish, would you agree? When you see it moving, though, I asked the guy who produced that photograph if I could use it. He said, no, I'll send you the video. <laughs> so this is, what he, this, is what he, this is what they do, right? Now, I'd like you to picture this. You are a yellow perch swimming by. You're looking for food, and you see this thing wriggling on the bottom of the, of the river. You might go for it, right? And so the other perch do go for it. And when they strike, the lamp muscle releases its larvae. They clamp onto the gills of the other perch. The other perch swims off and does whatever the other perch does. And sometime later, the little larvae drop off. And that is how lamp muscles get about the place. They hang onto the gills, and then they release. So I put two and two together, and I thought, maybe. Kingfisher saw a fish on the bottom of the lake and went for it, and unfortunately it wasn't a fish, it was an ant muscle. So that's all supposition. I wasn't there, and I don't get to, you know, ask the favorite teenager question, what were you thinking, right? But um, anyway, that's what I think is happening, and uh, what little did I say about that? And I presented this at a conference for the Northern Woodlands people, and um, well, there's my timer telling me it's 50 minutes, so I sh should talk fast or stop. <laughs> and, and there was a guy there, he makes this amazing art out of feathers. And he took the essay that we read, and he took the art that Adelaide did, and he took a feather, and he made himself a kingfisher and a bunch of little fish. And uh, he took the essay and he put it on his website, right? And I was kind of like, I don't know if I take someone's essay and put it on the website. So I sent it to the Woodlands and said, what do you think of this? And the Northern Woodlands editor got back to me and she says, if Chris Maynard made art out of my work, I'd brag to my dog about it. So <laughs> here we are bragging to everybody about it. He, he, did, a, he did this amazing work. Um, and that's, that's how it goes. Art imitates life, imitates art. And it all circulates and it's all based on a photograph taken by a Vermont bird watcher. <laughs> anyway, uh, I wanted to get to the connections to the land a bit more. Um, this is a quote from Wendell Berry. Wendell Burry is a, is a natural history writer, poet, and uh, I like this. Do unto those downstream, and you would have those upstream do unto you. I think it's pretty good, you know? Because we're all downstream, and we're all upstream. And whatever we do has consequences. So, you know, there's little things we can do. For example, um, my rain gutters used to go onto the driveway. That's just the way the previous homeowner had it. And they'd run all down the street, Sounds like a minor thing of just putting rainwater into the street, right? Well, in fact, what I'm doing is causing the erosion 
in the river that's downstream. And that erosion is moving phosphorus from the river bank and from the river bay and sticking into Lake Champlain. And it was a simple thing. The gutters were falling off the house anyway. They had to be replaced. And I said to the guy, I said, can it, uh, that spot go somewhere else? He said to me, I'm a properly hung gutter. You can put the downspout anywhere you want. One end, the other end, the middle, doesn't matter. I can make the water flow there. And he did. So it comes down in the middle, it goes up on my deck and out. And now it goes onto the lawn. So that's a simple thing. I needed to replace the gutters that way, right? So these are the things we can think about. Um, the bugs are going to indicate the, quarter, the, the quality of your water. So back in the day, they used to carry canaries in the vines. And the canaries would flop over um, if, they, if they detected gases that we couldn't detect. And the miners knew it was time to leave. There was even a cage invented with an oxygen tank on the side because the miners stopped back for the canaries. And they would actually turn on the oxygen and bring the canary back to life. <laughs> yeah, wild, huh? Anyway, um, so when we go in and look for bugs in the stream, it's just like going to the doctor. So this is Anne, one of my students out there getting her bugs. And we can then look at the diversity of bugs that we find. And a healthy stream is going to have a bunch of stoneflies, many different species of stoneflies. It's going to have some dragonflies in there in the deeper pools. It's going to have some fruit flies, right? It's going to have, um, that's a dragonfly again. <laughs> it's going to have beetles. It's going to have lots and lots of diversity. And that's what you're going to find on a clean stream. In, uh, more, there's another kind of slide, there you go. More, many species of each of these categories. And that, that's the thing that people tend to forget. There's many species of catastrophes, many species of small plants, right? And if you're in an unhealthy stream, the only catastrophe you'll get will be those filtering collectors I mentioned. And you'll get midges. Midges are non vital midges are the most common thing in any body of water. But if they dominate, you've got some issues. You'll get worms, and you'll get snails. And you'll get blood worms, which are a particular type of non-biting mage that can tolerate the nastiest of conditions. If that's what you get, you've got an unhealthy stream. And these are exercises anyone can do in a classroom or whatever you're working with, with, with children. You know, it's a good thing. Get out there. And how many kinds of things do you see? I get a bunch of kids out. I go to the dollar store and I get ice cube trays. Because, you know, for a dollar you can get six ice cube trays, right? And that's your, that's your bug zoo at the side of the stream. And yeah, all you got to do is count the number of types you get. You don't even need to know the names of them. And you get a feeling for how healthy your stream is. This is work done by one of my students. And this is the proportion of the land that's either agricultural or urban. And as the proportion goes up, the diversity of bugs goes down. And you can tell she worked hard. That's a lot of samples from a lot of streams. But that's the type of evidence you can, you can get. By. These are all Vermont streams. She just went around with it. Yeah, a campus fan with a little army of students and got a whole lot of bugs and spent the summer identifying it. So, who do we get? All kinds of diversity. There's amazing things living in, 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 the, in the lake. And, you know, everyone thinks about the fish. But those fish are not eating the leaves that fell in. Anyone who tries to take a leaf and stick it on a hook and catch a fish, <laughs> there's going to be a hungry person, right? So you've got to get through the whole food web through the bugs before you get to the fish. So, um, these things, many of them emerge, and a lot of insects come out of the water, and they are absolutely subsidizing the food web on dry land. So there's a whole bunch of things that emerge and are feeding bats, and feeding swallows, and feeding other birds, right? And um, this one is the one that most often gets my attention around August. Somebody will show up in my office with a yogurt cup or a Chinese food container with something scrambling inside. And before they even open it, I'll say, aha, Dobson fly. Like I've got some kind of a fortune teller. And they open it up, and sure enough, it's a Dobson fly. Because people see this thing, and they think it's going to carry away their children. Um, this is an adult male. Those mandibles will do absolutely nothing to you. They're involved in courtship, and they cannot bite you. The females, on the other hand, have short, stout mandibles, and if you pick up a female wrong, you could be bitten. <laughs> so they mean business. So the, the, uh, the, anyone who's gone bass fishing, these are like, you know, Chanel number no. five for bass. They just, they love them. Crayfish is the other thing, of course, but they love these things. And there's Adelaide's version, so uh, I love her art. <laughs> this is, um, this is Doppler radar from near Toledo, Ohio. And that green cloud you're seeing on there is Bayflies. 
So they get enough wave lines coming out of Lake Erie that it, it, it shows up on the radar. And it, it happens also in the Mississippi River, and, you know, larger rivers and larger lakes. And the numbers are down compared to what they used to be 60, 70 years ago. You know, shop owners in Toledo need to go up with a snow shovel in the middle of wintertime, or the middle of summertime, to shovel the mayflies off the sidewalks so that people can come in and out of the stores. So they lost most of the mayflies due to pollution. And as Lake Erie is gradually being cleaned, they're coming back again, enough to show up on, on top of the radar. So, lots of things come out. The last section I have, we'll spend a little bit of time on this and issue of questions, is some of the problems and some of the solutions. I like to get the solutions. So we have invasive species. So uh, we've got alewife in Lake Champlain. We've got rusty crayfish over in the Connecticut River, the White River. We've got spiny water fleas recently showed up in Champlain. Zebra mussels we've had for longer, right? And they've gone through the, the whole country. They've even gone across the continental divide because people put bolts on trailers and drive off to California or somewhere. I don't want to drive that far on the boat, but whatever. <laughs> Somebody does. So, um, this is uh, one you may have seen on TV. You have so much fun, so, so, so. Hang on, it's very loud. Is that too loud? Is that too loud? Yeah? Let me see if I can turn the volume down, if I can even figure that out. Oh, God. You have so much fun, so, so, so little money. <laughs> vegetation and streams, and they've gone all through the Mississippi system, and they're knocking on the doorstep of the Great Lakes. They've installed an electric fence, an electrical barrier, to try and keep them out of the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes don't naturally connect to the Mississippi. There's something called the Sanitary Ship Canal, which is just like it sounds. It's for sanitary sewage and for ships to go from the Great Lakes to the upper Mississippi. And so what they've done, rather than closing that, they have put a series of electrical barriers to try and keep that fish out of the Great Lakes. Um, I'm not sure how many days it would take without electricity for the fish to find their way through. But that's all that's protecting us from that particular species. So yeah, there's two different species, the big head carp and the silver carp. And they do, they have not people unconscious. So, yeah, so, but they're, yeah, invasive species, solutions. Better laws would be nice. Better enforcement <laughs> of the laws we have would be nice. Um, the bottom line is we don't, we shouldn't be moving organisms. And when I say don't move organisms, I wouldn't even take something out of Lake Champlain and put it in shovel and pot. You know what I mean? That to me is an introduction. I wouldn't take something out of shovel and pond and, and put it in Colchester pond. We, we should avoid that kind of thing. And it sounds like you might think, well, who would do that? And I want you to think about someone buying a bucket of bait fish to go fishing. What do you think they do with it at the end of the day? Right? Dump it down the hole. And there are laws, you know, there, there are zones where you're buying your bait fish, and if you're paying attention to the fishing rules, and hopefully everyone's paying attention to the rules, um, you know, you, it's, it, they're designed to prevent that. But the enforcement is very spotty, and somebody might be fishing one day on Chevron Pond, and might be fishing the next day at Champlain. You know, it's a problem. Teen your boat, that's a big issue. Every part of your boat, Anyone with boats knows all the parts. There's a problem with that. Because when you pull your boat out of the water, yeah. there's no access to water to wash the boat today. That's right, yeah. So you drive it with you. Yeah. Everything's dry when you get home, so. Yeah, if you can dry your boat for several days, that's a good thing. But then you go from one fiction tournament to another at a different lake and stuff. Yeah. That's, that's how these things get around. You need a pressure washer in the access to it. They, they do, yeah. But imagine the cost of a pressure washer in all of the, all of the access areas. It's a good idea. I like the idea. Yeah, but the trouble 
that's coming from it without it. Yeah, it's huge. Which is, yeah, you can do the cost benefit analysis, right? Yeah. Well, if you have the water there, but uh, you have a pressure washer. Yeah. I mean, one to handle the job. It's like a car wash. Yep. Yeah. 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 And the trailer, people forget about the trailer. The trailer, yeah, the axles, everything. Yeah. I enjoyed your presentation, but why am I getting the feeling that it's no longer, I can no longer go swimming? <laughs> <laughs> two, re two reasons. Um, e, e. coli is one reason, right? And the other reason is, is toxic algae. So you don't want me to go swimming? That um, I would pay close attention to what the Board of Health says. What about swimming pools, public swimming pools? Pools should be fine. There should be, they're chlorinated. Oh, but no, no, we can't use chlorine anymore. Well, that's a no no. Well, they're using chloramines in some scenarios, yeah. and then they're using uh, bromine in other scenarios. But yeah, I, I, I see your point. I'm a farm boy, and I grew up with a lot of bugs. Yeah. And it don't bother me any. Yeah. But still, yeah. after listening to you, why <laughs> I couldn't get to that one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I personally don't swim in Lake Champlain because every time I swim, I get an ear infection. Lake, Lake Carmine's close to me. Yeah. You know, and that, that place is going to just, I don't know what's going to happen there. Yeah, yeah. So. We, we need to get the phosphorus under control. And unfortunately, even if we get it under control now, yeah. in, in my lifetime, we're not going to see clean lakes because the, the legacy phosphorus is there. But at some point, we have to say, Okay, we'd like to have clean lakes for our, for my grandchildren. You know what I mean, or my great grandchildren. At some point, we have to make a mature decision to cut the phosphorus down. But you know, the the other issue is, is the climate is warming, and at a local level, it's hard for us to control that, right? But because it's warming, it affects a lot of the toxic algal blooms in particular. The E. coli is something we can control better locally, because that is a local impact. So every time your dog. You know, does something on the sidewalk. It'd be better if we did it on the lawn, and it would be better if we bagged it and got rid of it. But you know, you've probably been on many trails and seen that people are not cleaning up after the dogs. You know, so yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs>